Thanks so much, Sam. Oops. Just for short reason. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, Sam, for your wonderful uh, generous words. Thanks so much to IE Out Club for organizing this wonderful event and for inviting me. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I'm delighted to be able to talk about diversity. I'd like to focus on T in LGBT. Um, I'd like to talk about training and the role of diversity training and sensitivity training in helping bring about uh, culture change in corporations. I've been doing uh, transgender sensitivity trainings now for nearly 20 years. I've done hundreds and have kind of lost count. But what has really come uh, to uh, fruition through all that training is experience which is based on a knowledge of the community and the conclusions that I draw from all those trainings are first of all, that corporate diversity training as it stands all too often gives short shrift to LGBT issues. So very often you'll have a corporate diversity trainer who's not LGBT identified but in the course of maybe an hour-long, two-hour-long training, might have maybe five or ten minutes on LGBT issues. And if you're really lucky, you might have a minute or two on the EOT. There are also diversity trainers who might be LGBT identified, primarily gay and some lesbian, who will do LGBT-specific training, but may have no expertise specifically in transgender issues. And so we'll focus primarily on sexual orientation issues and give sort of, uh, short shrift to gender identity and gender expression. It is really crucial whenever you do any sort of corporate diversity training, whenever you do any sort of sensitivity training, that include people from the community that you're talking about. It is also really crucial that the people who are doing the training are informed by lived experience, and that you address the specificities of oppression and discrimination that that group of people faces. I remember a few years ago, I uh, did a little workshop at a, an HIV AIDS uh, uh, conference in Manhattan, and a government uh, agency uh, representative was there, and this official asked me if I could de uh, develop a training for his agency. First, he, had, he prefaced it by saying that he couldn't pay me. And of course, as the saying goes, you get what you pay for. But secondly, he clearly had in mind something that, to my mind, didn't constitute training at all. He wanted me to develop a curriculum that was web-based, that was essentially just you know about a dozen clicks <laughs> to uh, make sure that each employee was government agency, the state agency, is certified as being sensitive and inclusive when it comes to LGBT issues. That's not training. When I do a training, I look someone in the eye and have a conversation with each person in the room. And the only way to do really successful training, whether it's LGBT specific or even transgender specific, is to meet someone where they're at, in order to bring them to where you think they ought to be. And so one size does not fit all. Although I've done hundreds of trainings, every single training is slightly different. Just like when I do talks, while there might be themes that recur in all my talks, every single talk is different because every single audience is different. When we started the campaign for the New York City Transgender Rights Law way back in 1999, I developed a circles diagram, and it's actually on my website, blindpark.com, but uh, just imagine for a second three concentric circles. The first circle, when you think of transgender, most people tend to think of the term transsexual. They tend to think of people who transition from male to female or female to male. They tend to focus on male to female with an endpoint of sex reassignment surgery. That's the image that most people have. It's what I call the classic transsexual transition narrative. 
When I do trainings, I start with that because that's what most, most people are familiar with. But I point out that that represents a very small segment of the transgender community. And the importance of diversity here, I'll use diversity in a slightly different sense, which is diversity of gender identity and gender expression in the transgender community. So beyond that first circle, think about, imagine the second circle, I'll call those the transgender. And those are folks who present fully the gender opposite their sex assigned at birth, at least part of the time. But beyond that, there's an even larger circle. And those are the folks I will call the gender variant. Those are people who, um, to some extent, or other transgress gender norms, even if they may not necessarily fully present the gender opposite their assigned sex at birth. Now, that's a lot of terminology. But what that really means is when you do transgender training, or when you talk about transgender, you're not talking about just those who identify as transgender. In fact, in the gender variant category, there would be many uh, gay men and lesbians and bisexuals, as well as straight folks who, in some extent, to some extent or another, transgress gender norms. So when we talk about discrimination, not only in the corporate world, but in society as a whole, it's really important to understand the full diversity of the community and the communities that we're talking about. Unfortunately, in the media, this is true of US news media, it's also true, I think, in European news media and Asian as well, uh, there's a constant rearticulation of what I call the transsexual trans, uh, the classic transsexual transition narrative. Uh, and what it does is it impedes the ability of people to understand the diversity of the community. When we talk about change in the corporate sphere, and uh, so many people in this room are doing so much good work uh, with regard to addressing LGBT discrimination in the workplace. It is therefore crucial that we have a comprehension of the full complexity and diversity of gender identity and expression. As I like to say, there's many different uh, ways of being transgender as there are transgender people. There's many different ways of transitioning as there are people who transition. Now, one of the things about doing corporate change, uh, changing corporate culture, is that you do have to listen to people who are in the affected communities. But conversely, it's really important not to burden those employees who may be LGBT. If you have one or two trans openly transgender employees in your company, listen to what they have to say, but don't burden them with the obligation of effectively training the entire company, or even finding someone who does training. This is their experience, but keep in mind that they're speaking from their own personal experience. And their personal experience may not reflect the full diversity of the entire community or uh, future employees of your company. Above all, be careful not to narrow the discourse, the discussion about transgender to a very narrow, limited, medicalized discourse about transition, which ends with this endpoint of sex reassignment surgery because most transgender people want, don't want sex reassignment surgery and most who do never get it. Discrimination in the workplace based on gender identity or expression can happen to people who are not transgender or transgender identified. It can happen to anyone. In fact, the interesting fact is that in legal terms, those states and cities in the United States and countries uh, around the world that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, but that don't include gender identity or expression, are actually creating a loophole for discrimination against non-transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual people based on their gender expression. So it's really crucial that uh, language be comprehensive that include gender identity and gender expression as well as sexual orientation. In the US, there are now 19 states and about 250 or so localities, cities and counties, that explicitly include gender identity and gender expression in the non-discrimination laws. What that means is there are 31 states and thousands of localities that don't. Corporate 
descriptions in the Fortune 500 are actually far in advance of the U.S. federal government, many countries around the world, and many states and localities in the United States when it comes to prohibiting discrimination. It's all more reason for corporations to take a lead when it comes to insisting on legislation at the federal, state, and local level, both in the United States and in other countries, that explicitly prohibits discrimination based on gender identity and expression, as well as sexual orientation. As many of us know, the new administration in Washington is unlikely to be a strong ally to the LGBT community, to put it as generously as possible. And that is all the more reason for those who are active in LGBT anti-discrimination work in the corporate sphere uh, to use what influence they have to advance a progressive agenda of policy change that empowers LGBT people as well as others. A cautionary note, do not get sucked into the bathroom panic. Some of you might have heard of the many bills that are pending in state legislatures back in the US, uh, which have to do with which public restroom transgender people use. It is nothing but a red herring. There's no legitimate basis for such legislation. The state of North Carolina uh, enacted such a law, HB2, with disastrous consequences for the state. And in fact, the business community in North Carolina, which is hired in, you know, a radical left formation, virtually as one, stood up and said, this is absurd. Even local police forces in the state uh, found whole thing absurd. I remember an interview with a um, police uh, chief in a small town, a woman, who was asked by a reporter, uh, what are you going to do now that HB2 has been enacted into law? And she said, nothing. <laughs> We're not going to do anything because we have a small, uh, police force in this town, and to enforce this law, we have to put every single police officer, post every single police officer in front of uh, the door of some public restroom in town. So these laws are unenforceable, but the real agenda is actually to roll back uh, civil rights and LGBT rights legislation, not only for LGBT people, but for all people. So for example, HB2 repealed every local uh, city and county civil rights or human rights law that prohibited discrimination in the state of North Carolina based not only on sexual orientation and gender identity, but also race, ethnicity, national origin, uh, disability, veteran status, etc. So the bathroom panic is just uh, the tip of the spear in terms of the right-wing uh, agenda to push back civil rights and human rights legislation in the U.S. I certainly hope that this doesn't uh, rear its ugly head here in Europe, but that's always possible. When we think about discrimination, let's think about discrimination intersectionally and think about multiple oppressions. This is not only important uh, in terms of protecting people from discrimination in the workplace, it's also crucial for the effectiveness of any corporate non-discrimination policy. Uh, when Zane was introducing me, he mentioned uh, the work I did on school bullying. And we were able to do legislation through the New York City Council and the New York State Legislature that prohibited discrimination and bias-based harassment in public schools based not only on sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, but also all the other important categories of race and ethnicity. Uh, national origin, uh, disability, etc. I'll just cite one moment in the campaign for New York City, uh, uh, Dignity in All Schools Act, which prohibited bullying and bias based harassment in public schools in the five boroughs. We were having a really hard time getting the attention of the administration, the public administration, and by Bloomberg's chancellor, uh, Joel Kahn, until members of the coalition, uh, three Asian American organizations, took to the streets and did a number of major public actions that got media attention and got the attention of the mayor and the chancellors of the schools. Anti-bullying bills 
In the US, and this might be true here in Europe and elsewhere, are typically viewed as gay bills. They're typed as gay bills because um, the focus of the media almost invariably is on uh, the provisions of the bill that would prohibit bullying and bias against trans men against LGBT students, which unfortunately is still pervasive in many schools uh, in the United States. But when you forefront coalitional work with organizations of color, women's organizations, civil rights, human rights, and social justice organizations, you build a stronger coalition, and you build a stronger message. And you also are able to recruit support from many, many other communities. So what I'd like to recommend to folks when they think about uh, anti-discrimination work, whether it's in the corporate sphere or the public policy sphere, think as broadly as possible about who suffers from discrimination and who benefits from non-discrimination law. I'm going to finish with a little story. And on the face of it, it actually has nothing to do with LGBT. So several years ago, I was at the uh, Museum of Modern Art, one of my favorite museums in Manhattan, uh, seeing a film with a friend of mine. Uh, Boma has a great film series. So I went to the women's room, my friend went to the men's room. As usual, there was a line, there was a line for the women's room. As well as. Uh, and there were two women in front of me, and then the door swung open, and there was a man, a very old man, in a wheelchair, being pushed by a woman. Now, this woman didn't say anything to the three women lying in front of me. She had obviously been through this hundreds of times. But she kind of, you know, gently pushed her way through and went to the handicap accessible uh, stall. And one of the women in line was hugging to the other woman, complaining about uh, the woman and the man barge man. Now this was a man who was clearly extremely disabled and couldn't go to the restroom on his own. Accessibility for people with disabilities, accessibility for families with young children, and accessibility for transgender people are all part of the same puzzle about access to all. And this is a really interesting lesson in compassion, or the lack of it, and the intersection of the interest of families, and I'm not sure what the relationship of the woman was to the older man, whether she was his daughter, his wife, and friend. But I was really shocked at the lack of compassion on the part of the woman in front of me that she would even consider complaining about a man in a wheelchair being pushed uh, into a public restaurant. So think intersectionally, think big, think globally, act globally. As the Reverend Martin Luther King would say, the art of history is long but it bends towards justice. So we need to work to bend it further. And as Mahatma Gandhi would say, we must be the change that we seek in the world. Let's be that change together.